So, um, the third of these Adventures in Heritage Science presentations um, is a bit different in that it doesn't focus on a specific example of heritage science in action, um, and nor am I a heritage scientist um, by profession. Um, instead, I'm going to talk to you about heritage science in the context of the National Heritage Science Strategy, giving examples of how heritage science can deliver impact and talk about a project underway at the National Heritage Science Forum to identify recent heritage science research and establish where gaps remain or what the opportunities for future research are. So heritage science is a very broad area of activity which I have reduced here to probably a ridiculously simple sentence. Um, the application of science and technology to the understanding of heritage. It covers science used in conservation, as described by Paul, um, but also topics such as protecting heritage from the impact of climate change, um, or things like investigations into increasing access through <coughs> virtual handling of artifacts. Some heritage science research focuses on process, um, so that might be the development of techniques and tools that will enable new investigations, whilst other research focuses on impact, um, such as how the results from heritage science investigations can be used to further understanding and engagement. I've identified three main areas of impact, um, which are really so that we can uh, look after our heritage better, so that we can understand our heritage better, and so that we can involve more people in the process of discovering new things about heritage. In the UK, uh, the National Heritage Science Strategy provides a framework for understanding where heritage science research is needed. It was developed in response to a House of Lords Select Committee inquiry into science and heritage, which found that the uh, community carrying out research and the way that research was carried out was fragmented, that it was undervalued, not taken into account by government, and that there was insufficient new knowledge transfer between um, where research was carried out and the users of research. So heritage science is fundamentally <coughs> interdisciplinary. Um, it brings together arts and humanities research with that in chemistry, engineering, and the physical sciences, as I think has been shown by uh, both of the projects that Paul and Cecilia were talking about. Um, and it increasingly engages with industry. It's carried out by heritage organizations and universities, and it's used by all sorts of different people. The strategy has been a useful development and it continues to act as a pro focal point for all of these different producers and users of research. In itself, it was a mechanism for drawing people together as the people from different organizations joined forces and worked together on it. The strategy is underpinned by three evidence reports which looked at the role of science in the management of the UK's heritage, the use of science to enhance our understanding of the past, and a third document on capacity in the heritage science sector, which was about capability, um, accessing information, infrastructure, funding, and public benefit. So the National Heritage Science Strategy drew together the findings from these three uh, background reports, if you like, um, and the strategy itself was published in 2010. Its strategic aims are given on this slide, um, and I've included these here because I think they capture the areas of potential impact of heritage science research. So public benefit, public engagement, um, and a strong emphasis on partnership, and that might be in terms of collaboration with results of research, knowledge, or innovation, but also partnerships that can help to enhance the use of resources, funding, and skills. Now, I think it's fair to say that if you were to delve into the evidence reports yours, um, themselves, that they're rather wordy. Um, this slide uh, shows a few of the topics that have been identified for research in, that, uh, in one of those underpinning uh, evidence reports. Um, I chose these at random, um, but you will see that uh, they, they tend to be quite specific um, and detailed in what they describe. And on the surface, I think this makes it quite difficult to link them back to those strategic aims that relate to public engagement, partnership, and demonstrable wider impact. But the projects that address these topics, um, or others that are, that are similarly wordy, uh, can and do deliver impact. 
and over the next few slides I'm going to highlight a few projects as examples of how heritage science can have an impact on our use and understanding of collections. So perhaps the uh, easiest thing to demonstrate is that first area that I identified on the impact um, on the way that we look after collections. Uh, this research project, Collections Demography, uh, was led by the UCL Centre for Sustainable Heritage with project partners uh, the University of East Anglia, UCL Department of Statistics, the National Archives, English Heritage as was, the Library of Congress and the Dutch National Archives. And its goal was to understand how collections grow and depend, uh, degrade depending on use, environment and material properties. Um, and that was all informed by an overarching framework of cultural values. It used this understanding to develop a model which can be used as a management tool for looking after collections. And the research project engaged with just under 550 volunteers in its first phase to explore how visitors value archival and library objects and what their attitudes to degradation are and when in the future they would accept that objects are no longer available to read or display in a satisfactory state. In a second phase, a further 330 volunteers were involved in um, research which explored the thresholds for fitness of display in reading, in the context of reading rooms um, and exhibitions, and what influenced uh, readers' perceptions of when material was judged to be unfit, and that might be things like discoloration of the documents or missing pieces. Um, the research has helped those with collection management responsibilities to better understand um, what they've termed the lifetime of collections and has meant that collections can be managed and stored more economically and with greater environmental sustainability. So that's one area of impact. But it's also provided information about visitor and reader tolerance for um, acceptable damage as well as engaging large numbers of people in the research itself. It's brought together organisations to work collaboratively collaboratively and share their skills and knowledge. So a different example um, shows how heritage science can have an impact on interpretation and understanding. You may have read about earlier this year the research that the National Archives carried out into Shakespeare's will. Working with imaging science colleagues at the British Library, the researcher Amanda Bevan, head of legal archives at TNA, developed a new interpretation of Shakespeare's will as a result of imaging techniques showing that there was a difference in the inks used across the three pages which had previously been thought to have been written at the same time. The heritage science research, so in this case the imaging, has had an impact in terms of new understanding and interpretation. And if you've not seen it, Amanda has written a great blog about her process of discovery from which this text is an extract. Again, this project demonstrates the collaboration and partnership themes important to heritage science, with the British Library and National Archives sharing their equipment and specialist knowledge to generate new outcomes for research. In terms of wider impact, the story of the reinterpretation of the will gained good press coverage and the will itself was a key part of an exhibition at King's College and part of the Shakespeare 400 celebrations. So my next example is about involving more people in heritage science research and making the equipment for heritage science research accessible. These are pictures of the CIHAR um, Mobile Heritage Lab and that's the Science and Engineering in Arts, Heritage and Archaeology program at UCL. Um, it's a research and public engagement resource and as part of the CIHAR uh, Collaborative Doctoral Training Initiative, it aids the delivery of projects related to the research of the students on that program. Its purpose is to make heritage science widely available and that might be by bringing the lab to an institution that wants to apply to use it for research or public, or public engagement or through um, its own public engagement activities that it gets involved in. So, uh, yeah, I've got a link there. Um, there's an application form online and three rolling deadlines for applications throughout the year. The next one's January the 30th. Um, if you're interested in um, applying to, to you know, have the mobile Heritage Science Lab come, come and visit your institution and help you with your research. 
Um, an example of uh, one of its recent public engagement activities was a visit to Cheltenham Science Festival in June of this year. And they've got some great pictures actually on their website about that that I didn't uh, manage to capture for this slide. But um, in terms of, again, impact, it's, uh, I would suggest an exercise um, such as this is an unparalleled uh, public engagement experience for those students who are lucky enough to be part of the CHA programme. Um, and the activities were apparently very well received uh, by people attending the festival, though I'm afraid I haven't got numbers from CHA colleagues. But I thought it was interesting that um, it also brings heritage science to new audiences, and I quote from from Seahart, many visitors were surprised, even pleased, that such an application of science existed. So we're, we're breaking new ground on that front. And then finally, um, I thought my last slide in this section uh, would sort of highlight the potential impact that projects such as these can have on the profile of an organisation. Uh, this being an example of how research um, into a Mesoamerican manuscript at the Bodleian, again using uh, imaging techniques, was picked up by the press. That's, has that one come up yet? That one, that's my favourite one, Bodleian boffins, uncover images. <laughs> Um, but seriously, you know, this is, this is good for profile, um, it's good for research visibility, it's good for the visibility of the organisation, and of course it has the potential to attract further funding and resources um, for research, if, if nothing else. So moving on to current and future opportunities. In 2015, the National Heritage Science Forum began the project Filling the Gaps to find out what's happened in terms of science and heritage research over the five years since the publication of the Heritage Science Strategy. Um, we commissioned a small piece of research that went through the Gateway to Research database, which publishes um, Research Council funded research, to identify projects from 2010 onwards and to map those projects to the topics that had been identified in the evidence reports for the Heritage Science Strategy. Um, and it was a fairly complicated exercise, I have to say. Um, the research focused on mapping just one of the evidence reports, the role of science in the management of the UK's um, heritage which itself has four themes and multiple uh, sort of subtopics. I think we identified 64 topics to map against and after interrogating the Research Gateway database established that there were about 20 projects that mapped to 18 of the <coughs> topics. Um, and this is what you see captured in this slide, um, that uh, it looks like there's been fair progress made on research addressing needs uh, related to creating appropriate environments for materials and understanding the behaviour of modern materials. But there's still um, a fair chunk of, of um, research needed into adapting to climate change um, and understanding the material's behaviour. And I should say that the strategy is, of course, much wider than library and archive material. It covers built historic environment and archaeology as well. So, so not all of these topics are relevant to each um, context, if you like. Um, so the, the Filling the Gaps project has so far only looked at the gaps uh, in heritage science knowledge and practice. And this extract is taken from the evidence report that relates to how science is used, um, which is perhaps more valuable in the context of a conference on impact. But I've, I've included it to encourage you to think about the opportunities for using science and technology in the ex explorations of your collections. Um, the research report picked out that um, apparently application to library and archive material is particularly limited. Um, and I think things like the development of imaging techniques, have, as have already been referenced this morning, um, offer particularly exciting opportunities for investigation and future research. So as examples um, of opportunities that remain, uh, the ones that are, uh, the topics that are perhaps specifically relevant to libraries and archives are research into low oxygen and anoxic conditions for storage and display, although Paul might be able to help shed some light on that uh, for me afterwards uh, with his research into options for Magna Carta. Um, also things around the standardization of methods for condition assessments, uh, storage conditions for architectural drawing film, um, and the conservation and long-term management of acetate and heat set 
document laminates. Um, so if you have collections that include these types of materials or projects that would benefit from uh, research that would sort of achieve those goals, then perhaps teaming up with an academic partner might be a way of addressing it. Um, so these are the areas that were identified by the team that drew up the strategy as priority areas, um, and the research into them, um, therefore, I think one can assume has the potential to help very many organisations um, who are grappling with these common issues. But I mentioned at the outset that um, I think there are opportunities not only to apply science to the understanding material behaviour or environments, but also importantly practice new ways of doing things. And personally, um, and as I said, I'm not a scientist, I think this is where some of the more exciting and potentially engaging opportunities lie. So looking at methods, ways of doing things, new techniques and tools. Um, this just uh, highlights a sort of a few of those areas where I think current opportunities lie for research. Um, the main slide is, is just a snap from the Arts and Humanities Research Council website, um, highlighting a project that's collating people's photos to help preserve what heritage sites look like, um, a sort of crowdsourcing exercise. Then there are um, the collaborative doctoral training schemes, of which CIHAR is an example. Um, many of you might already be experienced in um, taking part in, in those uh, initiatives, but I wonder whether you've done it from a sort of science and technology uh, collaboration. That might be something to think about. Uh, big data, I love the term. I'm always a bit foggy about what it covers, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a big opportunity. And, and of course, digital humanities research offers new ways of exploring and exploiting how we can uh, use data. Um, so that's a real growth area. Who has access to it? Uh, heritage science, uh, well, heritage research has been identified by AHRC as one of its three priority areas moving forward, and they've just appointed a heritage leadership fellow uh, to take up his role in January. So this will be a key area for them um, in developing a sort of future uh, further strategy, and the types of things that they're looking at under this theme are around connecting people with heritage, around sustainability of cultural heritage, values and cultural heritage, so, so that might be an opportunity as well. Um, then, of course, there are sort of slightly more foggy issues, such as the impact of the restructuring of the research councils and, and what uh, the effect of that will be. Um, opportunities such as the Cultural Protection Fund um, and linked to that, perhaps, the export of skills and knowledge, um, particularly in this area of heritage science and, and support for uh, heritage overseas. Um, and, uh, and, and the B word, as was mentioned earlier, Brexit, which uh, I think you know, many people will fear, fear has a, a profound impact on the funding available for research such as this. But uh, we're also being encouraged to think creatively about uh, what opportunities it might pre present for new ways of doing things. So as you get to the, the filling the gaps bit that I've been involved in recently, um, one of the things that I was very conscious of when we got back the results from the uh, initial research was that, of course, um, relatively little heritage science research is, I think, funded by research councils um, and perhaps takes the form of these large projects. So um, we wanted to carry out an exercise that sort of uh, was, was broader and to ask anyone with a knowledge of research carried out in the topics that form part of the National Heritage Science Strategy to share them with us um, and add them through a survey mechanism. So the research, if you, if you know stuff, um, it can be published or unpublished um, and the, our only criteria really is that it's been carried out since 2010 which was when the, the strategy itself was launched. Um, and I've got a number of these surveys out at the moment because I've broken down that immense list of 64 topics into sort of 10 themes. Um, six are out at the moment and we're encouraging people to add information about um, 
it can be as simple as a project title or it can be much more comprehensive about exactly sort of who the lead author was, uh, which organisation carried it out, how much funding was involved. And what we'd like to do with the information that we gather together is um, share it. Uh, so that we can help make heritage science more visible, um, increase the impact of the research that has been carried out by making people aware of it, um, and also highlight where, you know, where those real gaps are, because I'm, I'm deeply conscious that we haven't really got to the bottom of that yet, and what the opportunities therefore are for future research and um, for funding. Um, you know, that we will talk to funders and, and um, promote those areas as, as topics that still need to be addressed. So if any of this has whetted your appetite for heritage science, uh, you might find our blog of interest, and the blog is the mechanism that we're using to put out the survey as well. Um, at the moment it is uh, rather dominated by the Filling the Gaps project, but um, you'll also find contributions from heritage scientists describing their very varied work if you scroll back. Um, among the items. And we've got everything really there from listening to furniture to the use of nanotechnology by Tate um, and um, exercise in crowdsourcing orchid observations by the Natural History Museum. So there's a, there's a great uh, range of examples of what heritage science can encompass on that. Um, this slide just shows who the current members of the National Heritage Science Forum are to give you a flavour of that interdisciplinarity and collaboration, which is at the heart of, of everything that, that happens. Um, and um, these are further opportunities to get involved and find out more about um, both filling the gaps and um, heritage science in general. So thank you very much. Thank you.